Hello everyone, my name is John Myers and I'm here to talk to you today about the spatial reach of brainwave synchronization. I would like to thank LabRoots for having me today and uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. The first thing we want to talk about is to understand the underlying nature of brainwaves. We've all heard of these things, these special spectral changes that happen inside the brain, but what are they? So brainwaves are electromagnetic waves that represent the flow of electrical currents through the brain. Right? And these currents are very complex, so they can send detailed information across neural tissue. But why are brainwaves so complex? Well, there are billions of neurons, and each one has multiple electrical fields at the sites of the synapses. And you probably already know that neurons are connected to each other via synapses. Um, and at each one of these locations, an electrical field is generated. When you add billions of neurons together, they get mixed together, and the signal becomes very hard to interpret for us on the back end. To record these brain waves, we use many different acquisition tools, some being non-invasive and some being invasive. The non-invasive measures include magneto and electroencephalography, which are very similar measurement techniques. The magnetic signal being read by magnetoencephalography, or MEG, and the electrical signal is read by EEG. You can see there in the bottom that these signals are very similar. So you kind of have a, uh, a great similarity between electrical and magnetic um, fields, right? They're just pretty much the same signal. Um, and so the, in the, on the right, you see the invasive measures. And we see here that there are firing rates there on the left and brain waves there on the right. When an action potential occurs, they contribute to the brain waves that we read with these electrodes here. And our non-invasive measures, our invasive measures include electrocorticography uh, and microelectrode arrays. Microelectrode arrays read um, single unit activity at a high density. So they contain hundreds of tiny needles or electrodes that read uh, neurons, single cells. And these electrocorticography grids, the ECOG, those read grid-like brainwave activity from the surface of the brain itself. Now, these measures, uh, these not invasive measures obviously require uh, neurosurgery, right? And so how do we interpret brainwaves? Well, if we take an example here and we inserted an electrode into the monkey's auditory cortex. We can use analysis tools like this to understand the waves themselves. So if you zoom in on that little patch of cortex, you can see that there, each little dot is a recording contact. And if you play a sound, the next panel over in A there shows the actual brain waves itself. If you play a sound at this time zero, you can see the brainwave response to the sound in auditory cortex. Panel B shows us if we just make all the negative voltages one color and the positive voltages another color, we can see that there is a spatial distribution of these waveforms across the, uh, across the cerebral space. The final measure here is CSD or current source density. This tells us um, uh, how local the activity is. This gives us an indicator as to the current sources and sinks or input and output of electrical activity at that, uh, at this particular location. And you can see here that across the layers of the cortex, that's one, two, three, four, five, and six, you can see that there are inputs and outputs, the sources and sinks, the positive and negatives, the blues and the reds, you can see different distributions of patterns there for, uh, for those. So this helps us interpret a particular, uh, these patterns of, of, of communication between brain regions. So these brain regions are synchronized, right? These brain waves are synchronized within this region. Um, 
and that that gives us an indicator as to the spatial distribution of those of that synchronization like where the input is where the output is um, etc right and so brainwave synchronization is also called coherence um, one re the reason why we call it coherence is because uh, the theory is that when a patch a given population of neurons synchronize with another given patch of neurons or group let's say cell group A and cell group E or B there, whenever they synchronize, they share information. So their membrane potentials can oscillate in a, a kind of song or a, or a symphony. And when they're synchronized at the same frequency, it is theorized that they can convey information more easily across one another. B and C, for example, have a bad phase relationship where the peak of one wave corresponds to another wave. And so in theory, these waves don't communicate with each other as well, right? So those brain regions, if they are coming from two different brain regions or two different populations of cells, they'll communicate less strongly than A and B will. And these indicate structured patterns of excitation and inhibition. That's the key idea here, is that we know that neurons fire action potentials, right? But what controls, what drives these phenomena are neural oscillations to a large degree. You need to have this temporally refined control of excitation and inhibition. These on and off states have to be controlled very systematically and oscillations or brain waves are the way that this is done. And so we'll call this phenomenon coherence to make things simpler, right? The phase here is the key. Our second goal here, now that we understand a little bit about what brain waves are and how they're generated, is to understand how brain wave synchronization might play a role in cognition and behavior. So the first instance that I feel is relevant. Um, the most classical example of coherence in many ways is to depict cortical spinal activity, like you're just a simple movement of your hand. And so if you, and we all know about the, um, you know, the cortical spinal tract, the connections between the brain and the spinal cord and your muscles, right? So we know that here, for example, if you put, so they used MEG in this study, and they read the magnetic signals from the surface of the scalp, and uh, they attached a um, myoelectrographic, right, electrode on the muscle in the hand. And at the time of a movement, that coherence between the electrical activity observed at that contact on the hand and the magnetic, which is also half electrical activity observed on the scalp, those activities, those two different patterns of activity are synchronized in this frequency band, this 40 to 60 hertz there uh, during movement. And so it's, this is a classic example that just shows the, how coherence of brainwave synchronization is relevant to behavior because the simplest behavior of moving your hand involves an increase in coherence between motor cortex and the, the neurons that cause your muscles to move. So this suggests that there's some sort of strong link uh, in terms of synchronization between brain areas. And so the information is likely conveyed be, via that mechanism. Coherence also predicts reaction time during focused attention. This is a study we did using EEG, um, electroencephalography. So we just put electrodes on the surface of the scalp and read the currents. And we use source localization to find that these two brain regions, their coherence, their synchrony, predicts reaction time in a cognitive control task. Cognitive control is just focused attention. So if I ask you to attend to a specific object that has many changes, um, that uh, and you have to attend to these different changes and respond effectively and quickly. Whenever we give people tasks like that, 
it's challenging. And so these parts of the brain that are involved in attention are activated. And so their co-activation or their shared phase or coherence predicts reaction time in, uh, in this study that we published recently. And the third component here is that coherence can integrate sensory information. So by sensory information, I mean sights, sounds, uh, colors, you know, things that, things that evoke our sense perception, touch. And so for this, they commonly, very similarly to the previous study, they inserted an electrode in the auditory cortex of a monkey and they stimulated the median nerve and which is a nerve in your hand, right? And the monkey's hand as well. <laughs> and so stimulation of that nerve caused a greater response in auditory cortex. So if you simultaneously stimulate that nerve and play a sound, you get a bigger response in this bimodal condition, meaning two modalities of perception, you you increase the response in that area with bimodal stimulation. Um, whereas with somatosensory stimulation alone, which is that final box, the third one to the right there, you see there's no response in the area to just the stimulation of the medial nerve. So synchronization between multisensory areas and, and primary sensory areas like the auditory cortex are presumably the mechanisms that support this kind of increased response to uh, to dual sensation events. Because if you imagine the world that we live in, a lot of times the sights and sounds are happening at the same time. So you get you get you get multisensory integration just effortlessly. Um, traffic traffic lights are. Often, when the light changes, they are often accompanied by changes in sounds in the environment, the sounds of engines revving up or the sounds of brakes or things like that. So we so our brains are, are very specially designed to integrate this kind of information very quickly. And presumably, coherence is a key mechanism for, for this kind of phenomenon. The fourth example that I want to show you is that coherence can link the brain regions that underlie our emotional experience in life. And so we've all probably heard of the limbic system, which has a part of it as the amygdala and the hippocampus. And these two regions are important for emotions and fear and memory, respectively. Remembering what happened to us in the past, whether it was good or bad. Now, synchronization between these areas can predict memory scores. I mean, mood scores, <laughs> memory as well in other studies. But here we're talking about mood. And so lower coherence between the hippocampus and the amygdala predicted mood in this study. And so which suggests that an increased synchronization between the highly uh, well-known emotional center of the amygdala and the highly well-known uh, memory center of the hippocampus Greater synchronization between those areas predicts worse mood. Now, what does that suggest? That suggests to me, at least, that that increased synchronization suggests more information content being shared between this memory and an emotional region, which probably does predict, and we can see here in this line graph that it does predict their mood across many patients. So now that we understand a little bit about how coherence affects cognition and behavior and, and emotions as well, which is a subset of cognition there, we can now identify some factors that can play a role in how synchronization spreads across the brain. And so we know now from the first example that signals can be somewhat coherent across cortical layers. And we can see that here. You can see the shared phase in, uh, in those raw voltage traces in the second uh, part of the panel there. And if we look inside the thalamus, which is a sensory relay region in the center of the brain, it's connected to many different areas, subcortical and cortical areas that, uh, that 
carries information about our outside world to our awareness. That's, uh, that's one of the main functions of this region, like quickly integrating information about everything we're experiencing and even things that we have experienced in the past. And so these different regions of this thalamus or this relay station in the center of the brain project to different parts of the cortex, different layers. And we can see here that you have a population of, uh, of cells called matrix neurons and you have core neurons. These are characterized by different protein expression levels, which are what we are depicting here with the colors. And so this shows that different regions of the thalamus project to different parts of the cortex and that different cells are responsible for these projections. And so that the communication between these cells are what creates the synchrony across brain regions and across and within brain regions, right? Because here's this is just within auditory cortex. We can see the, the phase alignment there and the phase shift across cortical layers. This is from the same paper. This shows the distribution, the spatial distribution across the whole cortex of these core and matrix neurons. So this is um, mRNA expression levels for those of you who want to know the exact measure that's being looked at here. So this shows us the, uh, this gives us an indicator as to the spatial reach of these neurons that uh, are projecting to the different layers of the cortex as seen in the previous slide. And so you can see that there's broad and widespread thalamocortical connectivity, just connectivity between the thalamus and the cortex, the sensory relay station and the parts of the brain that do the, the heavy lifting, the heavy processing, which is the neocortex. Now coherence in between superficial and deep cortical LFP can uh, is seemingly substantiated by deep layered action potentials, right? And so we did a study where we computed coherence or phase synchrony between lower level, deep level action potentials and su superficial level brain waves to see how far this spread. And so you can see here depicted this phenomenon we call spike field coherence. Spikes as an action potential, single units firing off. How are they synchronized to the oscillations on the sensor or the surface of the brain? And so we can see that uh, about one to two centimeters spread of this activity. So it suggests that single units a bunch of single cells, maybe about a hundred or so single neurons can measurably send signals centimeters away or be synchronized with, because it's bi-directional communication uh, between with, with tissue that's several centimeters in radius around the cell. The key idea here is that if we if we pull all those neurons together and just take the oscillations occurring around them, then we see an even farther spread of this signal. So if we go back to two there, and then we go back to this one, you can see that the spread is farther for the pooled oscillations in the deeper cortical areas. So it suggests that these deep cortical oscillations, which are supported by different thalamic projections, we see that those can reach farther than the units themselves, right? So that's the key there is that these, uh, that surface depth coherence, coherence between the surface of the cortex and deeper layers can potentially convey information farther than information spread within layers. So I think that's a, that's a critical observation and, and one that needs to be uh, thought about more and uh, studied more deeply in the field. But that, under, that helps us understand how the brain talks to itself, right? How, how, how do we compute information inside of this 
amazing uh, computer inside of our head. Um, and so the next goal here is to, and, and this right here shows how far it spreads, right? So you, you have about a 20 to 30 millimeter spread of uh, coherence from a given region, which is a pretty good distance and farther than what we thought it was. Like the, sp the spread of the field potentials that I've been showing you uh, are very, uh, they don't spread as far as shared information as a whole, the phase. Finally, coherence connects brain regions. This is a study where they were, where participants were given a free recall task. Like if I give you six words to remember and I ask you in five minutes to tell me which ones you remember, they were given a task like this, right? And so we can see here what this shows is that low frequency synchronization across all of these different brain regions. The point of this is not to overwhelm you, but to show you how important coherence is. And so synchronization across all of the different brain regions depicted by the connecting red dots uh, was predictive of their performance in this memory task. Whereas desynchronization, which is depicted by the blue here, and high frequencies, Right, so lower coherence and higher frequencies, meaning less shared information and higher frequencies, also predicted it. So this change in greater low frequency synchronization, lower high frequency synchronization, increased memory performance. So what that suggests to us is that these higher frequency oscillations are considered most of the time to be very local, like very constrained to a small amount of space, whereas these lower frequency oscillations are thought to be more constrained or less constrained to local uh, space and more constrained to <laughs> external space, right? Which would explain why you would need increased communication between brain regions to increase your memory performance, but decreased shared uh, gamma information because the gamma oscillations presumably desynchronized might mean that those neurons in each area are doing their specific jobs, but that the increased synchronization at lower frequencies shows us the communication between those brain areas. So not so they're simultaneously doing their own jobs and sending information back and forth at the lower frequencies. I think that's a critical idea to, to, to convey here that these different frequency bands are conveying different information at the same time. So imagine tuning in, just like your car when you're driving and you tune into a radio station, you're receiving inputs from all radio stations, but you tune in to the channel that you want to get information from. And the brain does a sim very similar uh, mechanism of communication. And so the take-home concepts here are, one, that coherence reveals shared information among neural populations. Two, coherence is important for movement, perception, emotion, and thought. Three, coherence is a key mechanism for communication between brain regions. Those are very important ideas. Coherence is the same thing as brainwave synchronization, so keep that in mind, right? You can call it coherence because it's way less of a mouthful. <laughs> I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I would like to also thank LabRoots for having me on board. Mm -hmm. And here are the references for those who want to zoom in and make sure I said everything right. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone.